Ladies and gentlemen, it is my very great honor to welcome the 17th president of the George Washington University, Dr. Thomas LeBlanc. Ladies and gentlemen, good morning again. We ask you re that you remain standing. I'm delighted to again welcome all of you to this very special day in the life of the George Washington University, the inauguration of Dr. Thomas LeBlanc as the 17th president of the George Washington University. We'll begin our ceremony with the presentation of colors by the George Washington University Naval Reserve Officer Training Corps Ceremonial Color Guard, the national anthem sung by Millicent Scarlett a professor in our Department of Music, and will remain standing for the retiring of the colors, followed by the invocation from the Reverend Charles Gallagher, chaplain of GW Catholics and the pastor of the Immaculate Conception Church in Washington.
almighty and eternal God, assist with your spirit of counsel and fortitude President LeBlanc on his inauguration day. Give him your gift of wisdom so that his tenure may be conducted in righteousness. May he encourage due respect for virtue and truth. May he preside over this university with justice and mercy. And may you grant him health and happiness. We pray to you, who are Lord and God, forever and ever. Please be seated. Thank you and welcome. First, I'd like to me welcome members of the GW community, trustees, faculty, administration and staff, and of course, alumni and students. I would also like to welcome our many distinguished guests. We are joined by two former presidents of the George Washington University, President Stephen Knapp and Stephen Joel Trachtenberg, as well as the family of President Elliott. Also with us today are more than 100 representatives from colleges and universities from around the world. Welcome to all of you and thank you for being here with us and representing your institutions. We are also joined by former DC mayors, Vincent Gray and Anthony Williams, as well as many members of the diplomatic corps. Welcome. I'd like to welcome our emeritus trustees joining us today, especially Chairman Emeritus Russ Ramsey. Welcome to you. I want to recognize the members of the Board of Trustees, Vice Chair Ellen Zane, Secretary Grace Bates, and all of the members of the Board of Trustees with us today. Your dedication to the university and your thoughtful stewardship are greatly appreciated. I want to thank the Board for its hard work over the last 18 months as we went through a presidential search and then a presidential leadership transition. If I could ask the trustees to please stand and be recognized. I also want to give a special word of thanks and praise to the Presidential Search Committee. That group, ably led by Trustee Madeline Jacobs, did an outstanding job that produced a fantastic result. I'd also like to recognize the staff of the, uh, staff of the Office of the Board of Trustees who provided invaluable assistance during the Presidential Search and Transition. Will the members of the Presidential Search Committee also please stand? One of the presidential inauguration traditions is the delivery of greetings, felicitations, and best wishes from the various campus constituencies. Today, we follow that tradition and begin with greetings from Student Association President Peek Sen Shua. Ladies and gentlemen, Peek Sen Shua. Thank you so much for the introduction, Chairman Carbonell. On behalf of the more than 25,000 undergraduate and graduate students who collectively make up the GW student body, it is my honor to greet President LeBlanc and congratulate him on his inauguration. The George Washington University student body is diverse and distinct. We are enriched by our lived experiences, the places we come from, and the people we have met. We are passionate about contributing our unique perspectives for the betterment of our world. We are inquisitive and tireless in our pursuit of knowledge. Through our 10 schools and 100 research centers, we work hard to question the known and the unknown and foster connections between the academic disciplines and the wider world. Our character as a student body signifies that more than ever, GNB students are well positioned 
to take initiative towards building a more just country and a more equitable world. Although we are passionate about what lies ahead, we care deeply about GW and are vested in its success. President LeBlanc, your arrival at the university has made us excited about the direction we are taking. Whether it is through touring residence halls, hosting students at your home or on the Mount Vernon campus, or supporting green and common spaces and initiatives, you have demonstrated your willingness to collaborating with students to lift our university together in order for us to rise together. We appreciate your listening to the voices of students, engaging us in decision making, and your commitment to improving the student experience. Raise high, thank you. Good morning, President and Mrs. LeBlanc. My name is Sylvia Murata Walters, and I'm the chair of the Faculty Senate Executive Committee and a faculty member at the Graduate School of Education and Human Development. I bring greetings today on behalf of faculty at all 10 of the university schools, as well as the medical faculty associates. We are thrilled to welcome you to the George Washington University. GW is a complex organization with a strong history of working effectively in implementing shared governance as you have done at your previous universities. The faculty in each school, college, and the MFA have unique opportunities and challenges, especially as we have moved from an emphasis on constructing physical buildings to one that focuses on the human side of resources for faculty, students, and staff. As the conductor of this intricate symphony of interests, you are responsible for the not insignificant task of unifying these individual parts so they create a greater and more strategic whole. And you are already demonstrating that you are up for this challenge, engaging everyone in your strong academic vision creating a shared aspiration for how GW can become an inclusive community with a diverse global constituency. I believe I can speak for all faculty when I say we are ready to do our part in changing the culture of the university, in advancing our shared vision to achieve preeminence as a comprehensive global research university and in ensuring GW is the best university we can be. Congratulations and the warmest of welcomes to you and Anne. Good morning. My name is Dr. Vanessa Marie Perry, and I'm the president of the GW Alumni Association. And on behalf of our more than 275,000 living alumni in 150 countries around the globe, we welcome President Tom LeBlanc to the Uni George Washington University and to our lifelong GW community. I am a firm believer in new beginnings and I'm energized by change. So it's with great excitement and enthusiasm that we, all GW alumni, look forward to President LeBlanc's tenure and new opportunities for collaboration. In our conversations with Dr. LeBlanc to discuss his vision for the university, I'm impressed and encouraged by his thoughtful questions, his listen first approach, and his great appreciation for the alumni community and our volunteer leaders. Together with the GW Alumni Association Board, we are mobilizing our engaged network of alumni who will help shape the next century of this outstanding institution. As GW alumni, we are diverse in experience and united by our love and commitment to the university. Dr. LeBlanc, we are delighted to partner with you to support your vision 
in Advance GW. Your success is our success, and our success is GW's future. Again, congratulations and a warm Colonial's welcome to you and Anne from the GW community. Good morning. My name is Barbara Giorgini. I'm the Executive Director of the GW Libraries. I'm honored to be here today to offer President LeBlanc and his wife, Anne, greetings on behalf of the George Washington University staff. Together with faculty, we are a diverse, multi-talented workforce of 11,500 individuals proudly serving more than 25,000 students from across the world. Like you, the GW staff believes in the transformative power of higher education and takes great pride in enabling and empowering students and faculty to become leaders and to meet the great challenges of our evolving global community. In your first few months as president, you have listened to us, learned from us, and reminded us of our potential to help GW reach preeminence as a comprehensive global research university. You have also identified some challenges that we must overcome in order to do so. President LeBlanc, I can honestly tell you that after almost 20 years of working in the Gelman Library, one of the busiest buildings on the Foggy Bottom campus, I have witnessed incredible commitment and resilience from the GW staff. I stand convinced that working together, GW will achieve its aspirations and in the process become an even better place to work, a place where diversity is celebrated, respect and inclusiveness are second nature, and where we can all truly say we are proud to be GW. On behalf of the George Washington University staff, congratulations, welcome, and raise high. So thank you all for your thoughtful greetings. Since World War II, the George Washington University has only inaugurated four presidents. Today, we gather to inaugurate our fifth, the 17th president of the George Washington University, Thomas J. LeBlanc. He joins a distinguished fraternity with Thomas Henry Carroll, Lloyd Hartman Elliott, Stephen Joel Trachtenberg, and Stephen Knapp. As I mentioned earlier, Presidents Trachtenberg and Knapp, or as we affectionately call them, the Steves, are with us today. We're also joined by the family of President Elliott. President Thomas Henry Carroll, our 13th president, sadly died after a short time in office. He was succeeded by President Elliott in 1965. President Lloyd Hartman Elliott became the university's 14th president during the turbulent years of the Vietnam era. He is credited with steering GW through that difficult time of protests and conflict and bringing financial stability and significant academic growth. Under President Elliott, the university endowment grew from $8 million to $200 million. Elliott modernized GW and built much of the campus as we know it today. The Academic Center, Funger Hall, Lerner Hall, Ross Hall, the Marvin Center, the Smith Center, and the Gelman, Burns, and Himmelfarb libraries. Elliott began the GW Educational Opportunity Program and the faculty rank of university professor. His presidency helped establish GW as a comprehensive research university. Thank you, President Elliott, and again, welcome to his family. President Emeritus Stephen Joel Trachtenberg, the 15th president of the university, became president in 1988. Under President Trachtenberg, the university was transformed from a regional commuter school to an urban residential institution with national reputation. 
President Trachtenberg more than doubled the undergraduate population, improved the quality of the students and faculty, added five new schools, and completed the university's $500 million centuries campaign. He also dramatically expanded our facilities, acquiring both the Virginia Science and Technology Campus and the beautiful Mount Vernon Campus. The university also built academic buildings, 1957 East Street, to Kez Hall, along with many of our new dormitories. Trachtenberg started a program of full scholarships for DC public school students, later named the Trachtenberg Scholarships. In his nearly two decades of leadership, he helped to shape the GW experience as we know it today. Thank you, President Trachtenberg. <laughs> president Emeritus Stephen Knapp is the 16th president of the university. President Knapp arrived at GW in 2007 and ably steered the university through the Great Recession. Under his leadership, GW solidified its position as a comprehensive research university, rising in the NSF research rankings from a low of 134 to 89th. President Knapp added over 100 tenured faculty lines, opened the School of Nursing, built the Milken Institute of Public Health Building, GW Museum, District House, and the Science and Engineering Hall, where we will all gather later today. The university also acquired the Corcoran Gallery of Art and its College of Art and Design, and completed the $1 billion Making History campaign, which included securing the largest single gift in GW's history. During President Knapp's tenure, the university became a national model amongst universities for urban sustainability and community service. He worked tirelessly to make a GW education available to all through his Access and Success program, raising over $200 million for the Power and Promise Scholarship Fund. Thank you, President Knapp. GW has benefited from more than five decades of outstanding presidential leadership. We are grateful to all of them for their contributions, but our history can also be told through GW's countless individual stories. I am one of those stories. I accepted and 36 years ago, GW offered me a trustee scholarship. How ironic. I accepted it and first set foot on the campus in September of 1981. Lloyd Elliott was our president. Like every GW student, I had dreams and ambitions. I commuted from home, then lived in Thurston Hall, went to class day and night, worked every job from valet parking to driving a limo to programming computers. I went on to get a degree in electrical engineering and graduated in 1985, and went into a career as an engineer, then entrepreneur, then investor, but I had no plans of ever coming back to GW. Then in the year 2000, GW came calling again. My friend Russ Ramsey invited me to give a speech at the board's leadership retreat. I don't remember the details of the speech, but I know I made the case for why we shouldn't close the engineering school during the greatest technology revolution in history. So having saved the engineering school, at least in my own mind, I was asked to join the Board of Trustees in 2002. I gladly accepted. I wanted to give back to GW for the education, experiences, friendships, and opportunities that it gave me. GW helped me realize my dreams. I have now served on the board for 15 years and as chair since 2013. I have now been part of this university community for over 30 years. This is not the same George Washington University it was when I arrived. GW has been transformed and grown because of tremendous presidential leadership and the countless contributions of each individual only at GW Story. We now have more than 26,000 students from all 50 states and 130 countries. Our students have more than 12,000 internships. They are working everywhere you can imagine. National Institutes of Health, the World Bank, the State Department, Capitol Hill, and hundreds of private companies. They graduate and leave GW for once in a lifetime opportunities to make their mark on the world and hopefully, like me, get to come right back here. 
Our world-class faculty of scholars engages every day in research and teaching, from the arts to engineering, from law to medicine and public health, from business to education. We study subjects from the Middle East to autism. We develop new strategies to cure HIV AIDS. We educate and challenge our students in a comprehensive array of fields and disciplines. Now I know a lot of people would say this about their own universities, but there really is no place like the George Washington University. In a city shaping the future of the world, GW is a university where our faculty and students with the support of our staff not only study the world, but work every day to change it for the better. As an alum, donor, trustee, and chair of the board, I could not be prouder of where GW is today. And I could not be more excited about where we will be tomorrow. I am thrilled that we will be guided, guided there by an inspiring and proven academic leader. Dr. LeBlanc is already working tirelessly to enhance our student and alumni experiences. He is leading our academic community in thoughtful conversation to define who we are and most importantly, who we want to be as we continue on our path of growth and distinction. Today, we gather as a community to honor our history and the individuals who have helped shape it. We come to celebrate the inauguration of Thomas J. LeBlanc, welcome him to our GW family, and invite him to add his story to our future history. GW has been fortunate to have great leaders our good fortune continues with the inauguration of President LeBlanc. But great leaders need great communities to lead. I believe the future of the George Washington University is bright because of all of you. So in closing, I ask that each of you, from students to presidents, consider the words of Nelson, Nelson Mandela. Education is the most powerful weapon which you can use to change the world. We can change the world and make it a better place. It is in your hands to make a difference. Thank you. And now please welcome the George Washington University Wind Ensemble and our university singers performing The Last Words of David, a composition by the distinguished 20th century composer and educator, Randall Thompson.
We are honored to be joined today by Dr. Donna Shalala. Dr. Shalala's distinguished career is one defined by her service. In the early 1960s, when President John S. F. Kennedy created the Peace Corps, she was one of the first to volunteer. She then went on to a remarkable career in higher education, serving as president of Hunter College, as chancellor of the University of Wisconsin-Madison, and as president of the University of Miami. She is also former president and CEO of the Clinton Foundation. Under President Bill Clinton, she served for eight years as Secretary of Health and Human Services. In 2008, President George W. Bush awarded her the Presidential Medal of Freedom. And most importantly, in 1993, she was an awarded an honorary doctorate in public service from George Washington University. Please welcome me, please join me in welcoming Dr. Donald Shalala. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. President, members of the Board of Trustees, faculty, students, friends of George Washington University, members of the military community, both in the past and in the future, thank you for your service. I'm delighted to be here to celebrate the inauguration of your new president, Tom LeBlanc. I have worked with Tom for more than a decade. Hands down, he is simply the best strategic leader in higher education today. I learned a lot from him over the years. In higher education, there are no more important partnerships than the president and his or her provost. I loved working with him. In President LeBlanc, George Washington has a real chance to move further in the top ranks of American University. He is skillful, deep, seep, deeply steeped in the culture and nuances of the academy, passionate about excellence, and he knows how to make strategic planning fun. And just as important, he actually likes young people. I can't say that about everyone in higher education. <laughs> he also has a remarkable partner, Anne. Well, what can I say about Anne? As I reported in one of his many going away parties in Miami, we were very sad to see Tom leave, but we were devastated to lose Anne. <laughs> I have known all of the GW presidents over the past four decades. When I lived in Washington, I would sometimes hang out here because I miss the academy so much. In fact, my association with GW goes way back to my senior year in college. I applied to three law schools. Um, I was accepted at the other two, but put on the wait list for GW. <laughs> Tom, I'm, I am still waiting to hear from GW. <laughs> A healthy institution does not need to begin again. In fact, it cannot, at least not with violating, without violating its integrity. GW began only once in 1821, when funds were raised independently and it was chartered by an act of Congress. It's important to note that while the university was the dream of our first president, it took private funds to make it a reality. Higher education has changed dramatically over the years. If you want to build a great nation, start with our vast array of higher educational institutions, public and private. Then send to them students of every background from every place on earth. Students with a passion for making the world and their lives better. In American higher education, and in GW in particular, our responsibility is to build an American house that can never be divided by race, religion, sexism, or homophobia. We live in a time when African Americans and whites see the justice system through very different eyes. When people are massacred in churches and temples, when synagogues and mosques are defaced, and when inequality and sexism and homophobia still plague our workplaces and our neighborhoods, and when immigrants feel that the welcome mat is pulled from under them, in this challenging environment, I believe that higher education has a special role. 
The, the Academy needs to do this, not just because it's right and just, because when the doors of opportunity open, when no person's creativity and intelligence is held back, when the engine of freedom is linked to the entrepreneurial spirit, our entire nation and the world prospers. Our students, our faculty, our community deserve to hear our passionate defense of free speech. They must hear our commitment not to safe spaces, but to safe campuses. That GW has welcomed thousands of international students over the years is extraordinary. The experience they have, the integrity they witness, the passion for learning and the open dialogue they experience will shape not only their lives, but the future of nations around the world. Under President LeBlanc's leadership, GW will continue to be uniquely sensitive to the world that it is part of. That implies predicting changes and responding to them in such a way that we are enriched rather than impoverished by whatever the future holds. My best wishes to all of you as you get to work under this remarkable president, under his remarkable leadership. My dear friend and colleague, President Tom LeBlanc. Thank you, Dr. Shalala. I am Forrest Maltzman, Provost and Executive Vice President for Academic Affairs of the George Washington University. We are very proud of our traditions here at GW. One of the oldest traditions for a presidential inauguration at the George Washington University is the Chair's Charge to the President. It is my honor to invite Chair Carbonell to deliver his charge to our new president. Dr. LeBlanc, you are now the leader of a university with an outstanding faculty, enthusiastic students, loyal and hardworking staff, committed trustees, and proud alumni. We're also a university with very high aspirations. Your selection as our 17th president testifies to our confidence in your ability to help us achieve those aspirations. In undertaking this great challenge, you will enjoy the support and cooperation of all parts of the GW community. A family with a shared sense of purpose that transcends each of us as individuals and connects us to the university's mission and its ever-expanding goals. On behalf of the Board of Trustees of the George Washington University, I charge you to take your keen understanding of history, your great appreciation for the academic vocation, your knowledge of the world, your sense of humor, your love of learning, and your personal integrity and combine them all for the benefit of this honorable, now nearly 200-year-old university. Dr. LeBlanc, it is my very great pleasure to confer upon you now the official symbol of the presidency of the George Washington University. You have previously received other symbols, including the academic gown and hood that you wear today. The president's medallion completes your academic costume and officially welcomes you to the ranks of the university's presidents. Thank you. 
Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Chair Carbonell, trustees, President Knapp, President Trachtenberg, the family of President Elliott, delegates of universities, honored guests, friends, students, faculty, and family. Good morning and welcome. Donna, I greatly appreciate those kind words. I thank you, but my mom really thanks you. <laughs> and I think I have a letter from the dean of the law school in my jacket. <laughs> I've learned a lot about leadership from Donna Shalala, more than anyone I've ever known. Whenever I'm in doubt, I just ask myself, what would Donna do? And the reason is this. Wherever she goes, she makes friends and she inspires people. She's helped millions of people around the world. And I asked her to be here today because of the positive impact she's had on my life. But there are others. Bill Green has been my longtime mentor and my colleague. We come to issues from entirely different perspectives. But when we agree on something, we're almost never wrong. And of course, there's my mom, Nita, who's joined us here today. I was her third child. She had six of us in consecutive years. That's why she is my role model. <laughs> and of course, there's my wife of nearly 40 years, Anne. When we first met, I had nothing but potential. <laughs> Some still doubt the potential. <laughs> but her love and her support throughout my career have been the foundation for whatever success I've had. Thank you, Anne. <laughs> now, Anne and I do a lot of walking. We've had a lot of fun exploring this campus and this city. Washington is one of the most beautiful cities in the world, and we're lucky to make our home here. We've especially enjoyed getting to know our neighbors. Right next to the president's home on F Street, we've got more than 1,000 neighbors in Thurston Hall. <laughs> They're all freshmen. They're wonderful. They've welcomed us with open arms at all hours, <laughs> day and night. I'm honored and humbled to serve as your 17th president. But beyond honor and humility comes a sense of pride in the place. I am proud to be a part of this exceptional institution, and you should be too. We should be proud because of GW's heritage and mission. We should be proud because of what GW has become. And that pride should animate the future we will build together. This university was founded on the vision of President George Washington. It was established in our nation's capital to, pre to prepare students to lead and advance the cause of the young American Republic. President Washington didn't want American leaders to be educated in Europe he wanted America to do that work and to do it here. That vision has become our mission, to be a community of learning that serves the public good. The university's founders did not seek to prepare students for the world they knew, a world in which the district was a swampy and provincial government town. Rather, they sought to prepare students for the world they saw emerging, a world dominated by science, medicine, law, a world shaped by democratic values that aspire to equality and freedom. Despite this grand mission, our first decades were marked by constant struggle to meet more basic needs. For our first 100 years as a university, 
we lived hand to mouth, sustained by the charity of the Baptist Church. We struggled merely to survive. Yet today, here we stand, within walking distance of our halls of government and the unique cultural resources of our nation's capital. We are just four years from our bicentennial, and we stand proudly among the nation's oldest and most enduring institutions of higher education. What we have built here, I believe, has brought great credit and lasting distinction to this neighborhood, this city, this region, and our nation. We have realized George Washington's hope and now seek the fulfillment of his vision. But universities do not achieve distinction overnight in a single year or during a university president's term. The path to quality and excellence is a persistent, gradual process. And so, as a community, we need to recognize my predecessors for their dedication and significant contributions to this place. President Elliott, President Trachtenberg, and President Knapp each built enduring foundations, one to the next, from strength to strength. Without these leaders, without the committed trustees who worked with them, and without our wider community of alumni and supporters, we would not be standing here today. Please join me in thanking these dedicated individuals for all they have done for our university. I'm honored to join my distinguished predecessors in building on this remarkable history. So where will we go from here, and how will we get there? Before turning to those questions, perhaps a word of introduction might be useful. Since I was five years old, every year of my life has been shaped by the school calendar. I went to college on a scholarship. My older brother and I were the first in our family to graduate from college. And that changed everything for me. The life and work of the academy have nurtured me, challenged me, and helped me grow both personally and intellectually. The campus is my home, and I have never wanted to be anywhere else. That's especially true today. I am proud to be here and part of this very special community, and I thank you for the warm welcome that Ann and I have received. My mother told me I was appropriately named because I am truly a doubting Thomas. That's a biblical reference. It means I'm a skeptic. I question everything. I learned early in my career that debate, disagreement, and challenge are healthy. I also learned that in computer science, as in most fields, facts matter and must shape and inform debates and disagreements. To quote Senator Daniel Patrick Moynihan, you're entitled to your own opinion, but you're not entitled to your own facts. And so on balance, I tend to be fact-driven. And I'm not the only person on this campus who gets frustrated in a fact-free environment. However, you can't test facts, you can't evaluate ideas, unless you hear them first. That's why this university must always stand firmly for free speech and open inquiry. Without free speech and the open and unfettered exchange of ideas, there can be no knowledge, no scholarship, no teaching, and no universities. The great physicist Richard Feynman famously said, I would rather have questions that can't be answered than answers that can't be questioned. In any classroom, in any text, there is no such thing as a final answer and there is no such thing as an unthinkable thought. That is true here. That should always be true here. Open, critical inquiry, vigorous discussion, and assessment of divergent ideas must and will define how we learn, 
how we teach, how we discover, and how we create. Without constraint, without compromise, and without apology. And now, what about our future, our next steps together? If the first centennial of this university was about survival, the bicentennial must be about something far bigger. No one doubts our ability to survive. We have greater ambitions now. We are part of a great tradition of learning that spans centuries. And by laying claim to that tradition, we are obligated to strengthen it. So it will be my goal to work with all of you to ensure there is no doubt, no backsliding, and no deviation from our chosen path, which is to meet George Washington's goal that we teach subjects in the fullest extent, to make his vision of a distinctly American approach to preparing leaders come alive right here on this campus, to see that our community not only receives and transmits knowledge, but creates and evaluates it as well. And finally, to guarantee that in everything we do, we seek excellence. In short, we will fulfill George Washington's 18th century vision for a national university and renew it for a 21st century. As we pursue this mission, we must recognize that we belong to a class of accomplished and established universities that resemble us in many ways. Today, I believe we are ready to move beyond simply belonging to this distinguished group. We must be out front leading, taking risks, making investments, choosing the harder path. It is the difference between membership and leadership. At GW, we will have a clear purpose. We will choose to lead. Now this idea, choose to lead, can mean lots of things. Let me explain how our university must define where we will lead, where we must demonstrate distinction. The leadership to which we aspire has four key dimensions. We must be grounded in active scholarship. We must be comprehensive. We must be global. And we must aim to achieve excellence in preeminence in everything we do. Each of those terms means something. And each requires choices, sometimes difficult choices. But while we may make difficult choices, we will not make false ones. Too often, people assume that the only way you can have great ambition is to have boundless resources. But that's not really true. We can do anything we choose, but we can't do everything we choose. And so let us choose boldly, but also choose wisely to commit to scholarship, to be comprehensive, to be global, to aspire to preeminence. These are our goals. Let us explore the choices involved in pursuing them. First, we will be an institution devoted to the expansion of knowledge and insight in all its forms. The drive to discover, to create, to innovate, to clarify, to understand the unfamiliar must and will animate everything we do. We cannot be content to merely impart knowledge. We must create it as well. So let there be no doubt we are in the knowledge creation business. So we will support scholarship consistently and across the disciplines of our faculty. We will do our work with integrity and with the goal of transforming fields of knowledge. Our scholarship must be consequential and reshape our understanding of the world. And all of this must be readily apparent in our classrooms, laboratories, workshops, studios, and even in after-class conversations. Everywhere learning takes place. We will be true to the maxim that the best teachers are the best scholars. 
and that these skills are mutually reinforcing. At GW, our aim will be for scholarship to shape learning so that our students experience how to learn on their own and think and reason for themselves. Second, a research university does not fulfill its purpose by setting arbitrary limits on its work. A comprehensive university must offer a full range of excellent undergraduate and graduate programs, including arts and humanities, the sciences and the social sciences, business, the law, public policy, engineering, medicine, and health. This is expensive and difficult. But we will not achieve distinction without that effort. The human mind is stimulated by exposure to the arts as well as the sciences, by applied problem solving as well as theoretical study. This university will be enriched by the full spectrum of human knowledge and experience. GW will aim to be a model of communication and collaboration across fields and schools. We will share in each other's work, share in each other's successes, and together we will address the urgent issues of this nation and this world. And that brings me to the third dimension of our leadership. We will engage with the world. We must be a global institution in every sense. Here on this campus, we shall speak the languages spoken around the world, read the books produced around the world, and study the problems of the world. Our curiosity will not be bound by this region or this time zone. We will recruit our faculty and our students from everywhere. We will send our faculty and our students to study anywhere. We have a global outlook and a global platform. Across the world, people know this university and they respect it. They know us because of the outstanding work we do in such fields as international affairs and global health. Or perhaps we are known by our graduates who came to this campus from their native lands and returned there ready to govern and ready to lead. Our graduates are a great credit to this university and demonstrate that what we do here has implications far beyond this campus. That is the power of knowledge. It knows no borders. The final dimension as we choose to lead is to seek preeminence. This means that our faculty must be among the best in their field, and our students must come from the best in their class. As we continue to strengthen the quality of our research and education, we will draw to this campus and this city ever more accomplished faculty and students. Excellence attracts excellence. Preeminence also means that we must be diverse because the advancement of knowledge requires the challenges that difference brings. No matter where you were born, the color of your skin, which language you spoke as a child, how you live, who you love, how you vote, or how you pray, you are welcome to make your mark here at GW. We ask only one thing in return. You strive for greatness and to bring distinction to this wonderful university. This institution depends on people choosing to make an education, a career, and a life at George Washington University. Each of you made a choice to come here. So did I. We chose GW precisely because of what this institution does and what we could do for GW. It was not our only option, but it was our best option. And may it ever be so that when people choose GW, they choose for all the right reasons. They choose GW because we are preeminent. They choose GW because we choose to lead.
so here are the stakes. If we stimulate someone to think differently and more creatively, that can change a life. If we develop an idea that can transform our understanding of a difficult problem, we can endow society with health, industry, beauty, and wisdom. If we open doors to a first-generation college student, we can change forever their opportunities in life. And who knows what that person might become? Maybe even a university president. If we build on this campus a model of how to pursue scholarship with focus, learn with wonder, and debate with respect, we can affect the culture, not only in this capital city, but in this nation and beyond. We can do this, but we all have to be committed. We all must choose to lead. And so I say to everyone associated with this great university, every member of the faculty, every member of staff, every student, every alumnus, every stakeholder, we have much to celebrate, but the world has not yet seen everything we can do and everything we can become. We can do this. We will do this. Raise high. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the George Washington University Jazz All-Stars performing When the Saints Go Marching In, arranged by GW Professor of Music, Peter Fraze.
Ladies and gentlemen, thank you all for joining us on this great day. I invite you to join us at the Science and Engineering Hall at 800 22nd Street from noon to 3 for a celebration with President LeBlanc. At that celebration, you will also be able to view artifacts from the life of George Washington, including the original inaugural Bible that George Washington swore upon, and pages from his last will and testament. Now please join the university singers in singing your alma mater. The words are on the back of your program. And then please remain standing for the academic recessional played by the GW Jazz All-Stars. Will the audience please rise? <laughs> 